and welcome everyone to another episode of Gaming the System. You've joined me, Alex, Jem and Matt, and we are three intersectional feminists here to talk about gaming through a feminist lens. And we are continuing where we left off in our last episode on video game music. Uh, I left you all on a bit of a cliffhanger regarding my answer to the question about why video game music has taken so long to be recognised on a wider stage at places like the Grammys and award shows and all that sort of thing. Um, and I think following on from your two excellent points, my answer would be that I, I don't know why <laughs> specifically, <laughs> but, uh, but I think generally I can infer that there's a lot of the same barriers, like Jem mentioned, facing, um, like, you know, you know, there's a lot of stereotypes and assumptions around video gaming and how, I suppose, a lot of those have been transferred over to the, to the world of music and, and the world of uh, composing music. I feel like it's a very classist um, type thing where I think it's perhaps a little bit elitist. Um, you know, the world of, of video game composing, I think there are a lot of barriers to composers in terms of like perhaps being working class and that sort of thing. I think it's not a very common thing for for those of perhaps lower classes in society to be partaking in. Certainly learning an instrument costs a lot of money and, and a lot of time and, and uh, space if it's a big instrument. And just getting into that kind of thing is probably a lot harder. Um, so in terms of like general recognition, there's all those sorts of other factors like outside assumptions and stereotypes kind of playing their part. But I think it's lovely that it has been recognised, like we say, it's taken a long time, but we're at the stage now where video game music is being highlighted. And what's also great about that is it gives us time to appreciate how much more work a video game score is compared, say, to a television or film score, because a game could have many, many outcomes, many, many paths, many things which the player is choosing to do, uh, which the music has to adapt to and wrap around. So the composer has to accommodate that and come up with multiple uh, types of track, multiple loops of track and kind of keep the music fresh and make it feel like it's keeping pace with the player rather than um, dictating the pace of, of the film, say, or the television, which is uh, a lot more linear in its, in its approach. And I think that's been highlighted, which is really great. And I think it's also given a platform specifically for this year's award to female game composers, which uh, I was listening to a lovely podcast, um, The Sound of Gaming, which I've basically binged in preparation for this episode, all about video game music. And uh, they spoke to the wow. lady who won the award and she said it was absolutely amazing to be given the platform and highlight female video game composers because they did mention classism being a barrier and gender being a barrier as well to two women in, in the industry, which I thought was a really interesting listen. And I encourage you all to go and find it. It's on um, BBC Sounds. I don't know if it's available outside of the BBC, but uh, it's on there and they have a back catalogue. Unfortunately, they've had to trim it down to half an hour each episode for rights reasons and copyright and all that sort of thing. So they can't play full tracks unless you listen very, to very recent episodes, um, but I definitely recommend it if you want to have your fill of uh, video game music. And it's definitely highlighted some composers which I've not heard of or had the time to look into, but now appreciate a lot more, which is really cool. But yeah, to, that's a long answer to that question, uh, which isn't <laughs> a necessarily a clear cut answer, but uh, I just think it's great that it's finally been recognised because I love it as a genre and I think it's just so, I don't un even understand how how composers get their heads around like having to compose for a loop of gameplay and things. How do you even start? I don't even know. It's amazing. So yeah, I think they definitely can be considered as a form of art and they should be celebrated for that for sure. In terms of my next question, leading on very 
conveniently. Um, do you feel that female game composers face barriers within their work more than perhaps male composers? I've sort of already answered the question in my, in my yeah. answer, but yeah. I want to... I feel like um, it's a... Um, so, sorry, you Matt, you go. I feel like it's a... Um, yeah, one of those unfair questions that mm. we ask on this show. Yeah. <laughs> because obviously yeah. We, we, we usually feel like people are, are uh, like, you know, well, I'm not going to say minority groups because women aren't minority. Um, mm. But... Um, but the 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 non-white male cis groups are generally find it harder to um, uh, achieve success and um, happiness in the whatever their chosen area is. So I did a quick search actually before I came on. I searched for um, top game soundtrack composers in the UK, and it came up with sixteen mm. um, composers, and three of them are mm. female. That yeah. So I think that sort of really and um and those three were um Jessica Curry, mm. who we've already talked about, yeah. um and um put my thing over the top, Jessica Curry and um Chipsel, who is um a chip tune music oh, yeah. um composer. Um and chip tunes for those who don't know are sort of um a bit of a retro form of music that you would have heard on your Game Boys and the older um, sort of gaming systems. And I think there's been a bit of a, a resurgence in that. Um, and then there is also, there was also um, um, Lucy Holland, um, who, um, do I mean Lucy Holland? Yes, Lucy Holland, who has also um, been doing some composing for various um, computer games as well. So there's just those three came up. And obviously that's that's British um, yeah. composers. So, you know, we know that, like, the vast majority of games are made um, in the US or with US groups. So, you know, I, I don't know what the international situation is. But, yes, I would have thought that they are, well, they I think there would be more of them if they weren't experiencing some form of um, uh, what's the word? Not prejudice, but let's say prejudice um, and challenges mm -hmm. to getting yeah. into the into the area. No, I think it's it's pretty much similar story across the pond in the US as well. Um, obviously, I think I've already mentioned Sarah Shackner who's moved into the world of film composing now. She she um, did the music for the film Prey. I don't know if you guys have seen that, um, but that's quite a good one. Um, but yeah, and then there's also uh, Lena Rain, who I believe is actually a trans woman as well, uh, which is brilliant. Um, she did the music for Celeste, which is widely regarded as excellent. Um, I've not played Celeste, but I've heard great things about the soundtrack. Um, mm. have, Gem, I think you mentioned you might have. I can't remember. I haven't played it, but I have heard, heard, heard of it. I think it was on yeah. my radar. But I, yeah. yeah. And then I think there's, um, I can't remember if she is American, but a lady called Winfred Phillips, I think, who did things like Sackboy. Um, and oh. also, I think one of the smaller Assassin's Creed's like Liberation um, as well. Uh, those are the ones I can name off the top of my head, all thanks to the Sound of Gaming podcast, <laughs> but uh, some of them I already knew. Um, but yeah, it was great to have them featured on on the pod um, pretty evenly, well, as evenly as they can, given that there's probably a lot more male game composers than female game composers. But I think like anything, like any area or industry that women are working in, there is some representation there and we need to do as much as we can to champion that and push for more. <laughs> um, but yeah. But a, um, a pub quiz question to ask. Um, I read an article today that had an estimate of the percentage of the world's population that is white. Hmm. Either of you care to guess what number they came up with? Probably quite small, I think. 
because we all often think that it's well there's always the idea that there's more than there actually is I don't know that's an interesting one I think that's quite tricky well a um, new a new a new term for BAME is mm. um uh is is often banded around which is the um the um eth ethnic majority mm. i think is one of the one of the words so That's, yeah i no, still don't I'm really like that, that either yeah. <laughs> ethnic yeah i know it's yeah there is no so, there is no comfortable um no title because it's too because when you talk about it it's too homogenous you're trying to group too many people in one in one phrase and it that's the problem so yeah i think that probably it's a quite a small percentage yeah, they have to press you for a number 30 30 yeah 30 yeah 30 interesting they uh, they uh, estimated 8% wow wow 8% percent. wow and wow. so this is put, putting into putting it pers to perspective what we're talking about in terms of representation. You think mm. it's all I'll I'll give some anyone who worries they might be a dusty old man some <laughs> like some positive stuff in response to this as well. So just wanted to I think I thought it was really interesting to put into perspective. Mm. You got eight percent of the world is white, roughly a half of that percent half of that so four percent of the world's population is white men and Oppenheimer shows that they are still not scraping the bottom of the barrel when it comes to churning out middle-aged white men in in films it's absolutely jaw-dropping um mm. I think um I think it's a question of like legitimacy that comes up in terms of um, award shows. So it's the reason why women are passed over so much is that they're not seen as legitimate. Men are legitimate. They're the legitimate people. If you want something done right, you give it to a man. And if something isn't that particularly important, you can you can let a woman do it for um, as a uh, as, as a as a mercy to her. But other than that, and that's where the dusty old men problem come in, is they, they are stuck in that mindset of women aren't serious. The things that women do aren't serious. So we won't consider um, we won't consider them their work as legitimate either. Um, but so that's that's in one of the areas it it matters less that opinion, because when 20 years ago maybe 10 years ago um the means of production had not been seized to the extent that they are now and so there were still gatekeepers and king makers king makers say for example on mock the week they would have five men and one woman for mm. like 20 years of the show and the the show runner said he didn't think women were funny and that's why they did it and that's just the way it was for 20 years. But then Deborah Francis White just gets a microphone and a friend and an audience and creates one of the biggest podcasts on the planet. And so it doesn't matter what people at the BBC think. It doesn't matter what um, Emmys and Grammys think because people from, again, yeah, it is a question of class in mm. that... Um, in the past because the establishment the one percent have had power over all of these industries and so you were only you could only like try and you could only be picked out by the top now anyone with a keyboard and a laptop can make a music score and that that means that stuff is being made from the bottom up and from the middle outwards so that's what I mean when like this establishment and stuff matters less because people can do it without the without the whether these dusty old people care or not. And for people who consider themselves who are worried that I'm just having a go at old people, that's not the case. 
I'm having a go at dusty old people, because if you're dusty, that means that you're staying still. You're not moving, you're not growing, you're not changing. You're just staying where you are, gathering dust. And that's the worst thing I can possibly imagine. Whereas one slight thing is this could do is make if it makes a grandparent go, oh, my grandchild plays lots of these games, and I thought it was just he was just wasting her time, but I really like this song. Maybe I'll listen a bit to that and then watch a bit of the game play, and then, oh, that's really cool, and then I can talk to my grandson about that. It's the way that in order to not be dusty, you just need to move and you need to change and you need to grow. And the best way to do that is to, it can connect generations because everyone understands music. Anything that gets an older person properly in the loop of the life of young people, because look at what's possible now. Look at all the technology and the gaming and everything that's possible. And you need they need to choose not to be dusty, and then the world will then the world will change. And um, Jen, what you said is really interesting about your daughter in that she I, uh, that's a completely different way to consume games. Mm. To do the first thing that you do is go and find the music because it's that it is that important. And just if a if a grandparent asks the grandchild that, and they they respond with. It's such an authentic and organic place. That's that's what seizing the means of production allows it to be. And it doesn't matter what these dusty old men think. And the more that that happens, the better off we'll be. Not going to lie, I do the same thing as your daughter, Jen. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to be very wary about it because if I go too far, then I'll get spoilers sometimes, depending yeah, on the yeah. So with Star Wars, I've been going as far as we've got in the game and then no further because <laughs> that's quite a spoilery. They use a lot of spoilery titles to their tracks. Some of them are quite like non-specific and you, you can just breeze through and be like, yes. But yeah, I just think it's an, another way of like enhancing your experience of the game, but outside of the game, so you can think of like sometimes I use it if I'm thinking of how to get past a certain boss or like or just thinking about the game in general or just because I love it so much that I want to be immersed in it again and one way to do that is to listen to the music so yeah I I think it's great that's really nice to hear I'm not the only one Um, do you guys have any favourite pieces of video game music or even favourite composers? I really liked, um, I, I'm, so I'm awful at names. I never, I never look. So I never know who directed anything and I never know who composed anything. I just, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, one of my, um, um worst habits I think <laughs> but um but that doesn't mean that I don't enjoy what they produce um it just means that I can't then track them down <laughs> like, oh that person that did that thing um but I I really enjoyed the um chrono trigger music actually mm. which I think is probably um chip chip tunes um and um that was sort of yeah very goes back a long way but um I, I did really enjoy it and I used to sing it and I used to hum it used to stick in your head and my daughter when she was very little played played through Chrono Trigger and she as I said she loves the music so she got completely obsessed with it and I mm-hmm. still have because I used to share my Spotify account with her and I still have um Chrono Trigger music that just pops up on my <laughs> on my liked songs and stuff like from the distant past that she liked and they were there so um but i i really enjoyed um in dragon age when you went into some of the inns and stuff there was mm. a card that would there was yeah. kind of i really enjoyed the songs that they had um there and i actually like went and hunted those down um and um you know, not to bang on about it, but I'm also really enjoying the music in Baldur's Gate, um, which is good because going back to a point you made earlier, Matt, about 
you know how you always have something out you know you, you're always listening to music or watching something having something on the background I can't do that because I get really distracted by whatever so I mean I love I'm a big podcast listener um and but I can I can only do that when I'm not doing anything that requires my brain um although I do do it when I'm driving so I don't know what that's about me but um it so it's got to be stuff that I can yeah so I it's just kind of going on and I'm not having to like think creatively I suppose is, is what it means and um so when I'm gaming if I was playing something like Rimworld or Sims then absolutely I could listen to something or I could have something playing although Rimworld I found even harder actually to do but um Sims definitely but if I'm playing something like Baldur's Gate then I have to just be 100% in it otherwise I'm not going to be able to like keep track of what's going on so it's really good when the music is good and yesterday I was sat there and I was like <laughs> chilling out to the music I'm bopping along there chilling out to the music so I was in a scary swamp um but um yeah so those I'd, I'd say probably those and I think I, one of the ones that's had like a sort of lasting effect on me was um the chuckabo music from final oh, fantasy yeah <laughs> just because it's like it's just so upbeat <laughs> and it's like you're in the middle of this like you know really intense story and then you get in your chuckabo and it's like <laughs> and it's just really nice so i think you know there's there's definitely a, a music that has stayed with me um and that has sort of like influenced me yeah but but no no sort of specifics I think it's a more general I liked that soundtrack or yeah and for anyone interested the composer of uh Baldur's Gate 3 has an amazing name uh it's from Bulgaria and his name is Borislav Slavov uh or yeah. Bobby Slavov as uh, people like to call him. Um, and then Chrono Trigger, also they, there's two people who have amazing names, uh, Yasunori Mitsuda and Nobuo Umatsu. Sorry if I butchered your names. Um, but yeah, <laughs> those are the names. <laughs> yeah, if anyone yeah. wanted to look them up. Matt, what about I you? I recommend it. <laughs> Zelda, the Zelda yeah. music also. Yes, the Zelda music. Very... Yeah. There's actually um, mm. a Zelda concert, I think, that was going on tour recently of the music, which, again, I'm 100% behind video game music tour. Yes, I'd be well up for that. So good. I did want to give one mention to mm. um, Life is Strange. Yeah. The soundtrack for that, those two games, is are both awesome. And I, and I got... The, the game that I got came with the CD soundtrack. Oh, nice. A bit old school, isn't it? Awesome. Yeah. I don't even do CDs anymore. God. Um, and I really like that. But but I also really liked it because one of the tracks on it is um, uh, by Amanda Palmer, who is one of my <laughs> sort of favourite um, songs, songstresses. Nice. Um, and, um, yeah, so... So that had like that wasn't all specific specifically designed for the game. Some of them were were actually, but they were all quite quirky and not not very mainstream mm. music. So it was a really nice way to kind of give um, airtime, I think, to some underappreciated um, musicians. Yeah, nice. Um, when it comes to um, female game composers, um, the the standout is Yuka Kitamura, the um, composer for Elden Ring mm. and Sekiro, because those two soundtracks is they're such unique tones of games and subject matters of games that to be able to capture that essence of what it is and then expand it out so that every note matters and adds to what's going on. She's just in a, in a different league. Um, when it comes to composers in general, Bear McCreary, yeah. of course, the God of War um, 
God of War composer and who he is just a creative, just like melting pot. It's incredible. He did the, the intro songs for um, The Walking Dead. He did it for Black Sails and just the, the, the breadth of his... You know, some people that just, it's, they know that they were put on earth to do music. Yeah. They have that. It's not like a normal person, if, if, if the three of us were to sit and go, right, we're going to try and write a song. If I was trying, if I was to try and write a song with all these guitars, it would, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be as unique and as what he can do. Um, I think. Little tidbits of music that really stand out are. I sort of gave a list in the first first episode, but one thing I forgot to mention, which in uh, another intersection of accessibility and or potential um, intersection of accessibility in music, um, in Hitman in the third game, there is a an incredible level um, uh, that is a rave inside oh, yeah. a decon- I know the one. Yeah, it's in a decommissioned power station. And it's got this awesome brutalist concrete architecture. And the like the it goes down so many levels and there's this great big open dance floor and a DJ booth at the front. And you can go and uh knock out the DJ and get dressed up and <laughs> get the drop <laughs> and so and you can tamper with the um the electrics like where two of your targets are standing so that when you power the boost up it electrocutes them and kills them it's awesome and quite apart from i I could oh god i love hitman so much i need to do an entire series just talking about hitman um but when you and it's, it's very subtle when you walk across the dance floor the haptic controller pulses along with oh, the wow. music and it That's really cool. so when you're when you're standing when you're standing in the, the dance floor and you walk around you can feel it's like sonar just and i was walking around the dance floor and felt so it's something it felt it's like the the most subtle rumbling i thought <laughs> it's, you can't really you know if it's there and then i would just turn around in a circle and the location of the subtle bumping would move around the controller oh wow so the music is the intensity of it is reflected through the controller and it cool. just feels awesome just standing there on the dance floor just boom, 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 and thinking the the potential for creativity in crossing over haptic feedback with music just in terms of the creativity of that is infinite. And also it points out that you can use the haptic feedback for, you could make a sonar system with haptic feedback so that people with with um, eyesight difficulties hmm. can play. Yeah. And that's the only instance that I've seen that happening. Uh, it blows my mind. Amazing. Nice. Thank you, Matt. Um, I think for mine, I probably could dedicate easily another entire episode to my favourite video game composers. So I'm going to rattle through some very quickly. I think in terms of the way that music makes me feel nostalgic, I'm going to have to go with, I think his name is Nathan McCree, who was the composer of the first three original Tomb Raider um, games. And I used to play the, the Venice violins on repeat when I was little, I uh, had a, had um, a little tape recorder. Um, oh. In fact, I say little, I was like a teenager. I had a little tape recorder that I was using for my French oral exams, believe it or not. They gave me like <laughs> a, they gave us all little tape recorders that we could do. And uh, I decided to record, <laughs> to record the music of Tomb Raider onto a little tape so that I could have it for my very own, because this was way before like, any kind of CDs or um, streaming services were a thing. I mean, obviously CDs were a thing, but the game soundtrack hadn't been released on the CD. And uh, recently, um, the whole of the Tomb Raider soundtracks, the originals, have been re-released 
um, and re re uh, performed by the London Symphony Orchestra by Crowdfund, which is amazing. And they do a really good job of bringing that score to life. Uh, so if you haven't heard it, go and look it up. I think it's the London Philharmonic, but I could be wrong. Um, the other game composers that I love, obviously I've already mentioned Austin Wintory. Um, I've already mentioned Sarah Shackner uh, and forgetting all their names. No, no, Jessica Curry, it's come back. Yeah, there's so many others as well. No, you mean, I mean, just think about um, Jason Graves, who did the newer Tomb Raiders. He also did some of the games that we've played. The, um, the I forgot what the series is called, but the horror ones, you know, where we all take turns. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, those ones he did the soundtrack for those. I think what I love to appreciate about just focusing on, on one composer is like the breadth of work that game composers can cover, like the types of games that they cover are also sometimes so very different from each other. You're like, there's no way he did the music for that game and this game. They're two completely different games. But I always find that really interesting. I'd love to also know this is a slight tangent how hardcore video game composers feel about composers like Bear McCreary coming in from a film and TV background, mm. coming in and making this like, like absolutely smashing it out of the park with God of War soundtrack, and then kind of dipping in and out and going back to TV and film. What do they feel any resentment there mm -hmm. at all, or if there's like an, a rivalry within the different classes of composers, like, oh, uh, you must be a film <laughs> composer, you think this. Um, yeah, I just, <laughs> I just find that quite funny. But yeah, I could easily dedicate an episode to mine. Um, but yeah, I, do, I just, I just love it all. <laughs> At the end of the day, any games that I play, I always ap really appreciate the music in them. And uh, yes, just give me more. <laughs> That's all I want. Um, but, yeah. So we I have a you, public uh, playlist, don't we? I should do. Um, actually, no, we should update we that. We should we do definitely a new need one, yeah. to update that. Yeah. Keep your eyes peeled for that at some point in the future um, and enjoy mm -hmm. it. Because uh, there's plenty more of amazing scores that we can add on to there, for sure. But thank you very much for watching and listening. Uh, this has been a lovely episode. Thank you both for your contributions. They've been appreciated. And I hope you've enjoyed delving into video game music with us. Uh, please leave us likes, comments, share it, share this episode with other video game music nerds. I'm sure they'd appreciate um, hearing people talk about it because um, it's not talked about enough I don't think um, we do release new episodes of our podcast every Thursday you can find us on YouTube, Spotify iTunes and various other social medias so check us out and until next time thank you very much see you then, bye